up next on The Way of the Renaissance Man, talking philosophy, the power of fiction, and how to be an ideal man with the president and CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute. Welcome to The Way of the Renaissance Man podcast. This is a show about ideas, personal empowerment, and celebrating the rational life. Our goal is to help each other discover the tools needed to better focus our minds, integrate our thoughts with actions, and live the lives we really want. I'm your host, Jim Woods. How does a man go from reading Atlas Shrugged just nine years ago to becoming the president and CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute? That's the fascinating story of Tal Safani, entrepreneur, leader, thinker, and all-around Renaissance man. In this episode, you'll learn how Tal was introduced to Ayn Rand, how it quickly took over his thinking, and how he used the inspiration and courage he drew from Rand's work to leave a comfortable corporate job and create a Silicon Valley tech startup. You'll also learn about Tal's simple yet eminently beautiful four-step system for achieving real happiness in life, which all begins with having a proper definition of what happiness truly is. Plus, Tal shares his thoughts on how to remember the best days of your lives, which ironically often come at your lowest point. You'll also find out how to become really good at introspection, be a better valuer of life, and how to integrate your values with actions. And now... Here's Jim's conversation with the president and CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute, Tal Safani. I'm here with a very interesting man that I met at Freedom Fest. However, the organization that he's in charge of now is something that I've been involved with since the early 80s. Okay? But little did I know I would discover that the guy now at the head of this organization is also a fellow Renaissance man. Tal Safani, welcome to the Way of the Renaissance Man podcast. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here Thank and you. to get to know you. Yes, yes. It's been, a, that's, it's been one of the highlights, actually, meeting you, this, this conference. And, I that's, it. and you, we've been around a lot of smart luminaries. So, <laughs> so for those of, uh, of those of the audience that don't know who you are, yeah. you are, the, are you the director of the Ayn I'm Rand the Institute? I'm the president and CEO. President and CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute. Now, my, my listeners, a lot of them know that I'm into Ayn Rand. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a, the philosophy of objectivism. Mm -hmm. It's all about ra reason and reality and rational self-interest. Mm -hmm. And I'm a huge fan of the, the novels and, and whatnot. Now, I read the novel Atlas Shrugged in 1985. Uh, I okay. envy you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. As you'll hear soon. Yes. So, but you read the novel like in 19, or like 2005 or something. 2000, 2010. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now here's the thing. How do you go from not knowing anything oh, yeah. about at Ayn Rand to now being the head objectivist <laughs> in the country? Now I want to know how that happened. And, and, and I, want the, I want you to spare no details. <laughs> Um, Yaron uh, Brook, who was the previous president yes. and uh, told me, you do things really fast. And uh, in a way, he described how I work. I, um, from a very young age, um, you know, I, was, I was questioning things. And what happened in 2010 is that an employee of mine told me, uh, she told me, you, you're, you're talking like an Ayn Rand. And she gave me the book. I bought the book. Uh, well, she, she gave me the good book. I, it was on my ninth stand for about two months. And I started this project because I appreciated her opinion. And um, this book, a third way in, I said, I got it. I get what she's saying. And she's introducing a new way of thinking, not just content, but a new methodology of thinking about the world, Object objectivity, reason, and the morality of, of, of thinking about the good for, for, you know, identifying the good for being good, because I was an entrepreneur. And, um, and she didn't just open a window, she broke the walls. And I immediately got ignited. Um, I almost dropped everything and just immersed myself with, with her writings and uh, really try to understand what it means for me. I'm a very practical guy, so very quickly, it's like, what does it mean? And uh, less than a year in, I decided to leave my VP position in, with a 20,000 people company 
and join a startup with two people, right? And um, and move on from there to do other things. Before, before you yeah. go on on that, yeah. did your reading of Ayn Rand and the inspiration she gave you give you the give you the impetus to start that? Completely. I finished. So I, I went halfway into Atlas, then decided that I, I'm not worthy of the John Galt speech that is coming, because <laughs> everybody told me, you have to read that John. Okay. So I didn't know, I need to understand it. So I went and read all of her nonfiction, just to come back and finish Atlas. And the next book was The Fountainhead. And The Fountainhead is much more personal. It's about you, the hero in you. And I remember walking into my dark walk-in closet and asking myself, do I leave this company Amdocs that I'm in and do I join the company that my brother-in-law started and asked me to join? Um, and I asked myself the question, what would a Howard Rourke do? And then it became this clear, you know. Yeah, the answer was easy. The answer, the answer was easy. Yeah, see, now that's, it, it, it's funny because every person that I know that is heavily influenced by objectivism yeah. has that kind of moment of clarity, if you will, during when, when you're reading the books, you're like, that's right, and that's right, and that's right. And then pretty soon you're like, you can't believe that somebody else has the same thinking as you do, and in action, and also in a beautiful story that's exciting. Yeah, and, that's the power you know, of fiction. Yeah. That's the power of fiction, and, and when, I, when I read those books, I, I wanted to be like these characters in the books too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, but I was, you know, I was in college, mm -hmm. I didn't know really what I wanted to do at all, but I knew that, that this held a good kind of template for being an ideal man, which of course is the ideal man is the, is the uh, expression of, how, of the fountainhead. I call it know? the hero in you. You have yes, to discover the hero in you. And you know, uh, reading uh, Rand at the age of 40, which was nine years ago, rather than reading it at 16, I think has, an, of course, disadvantages because you lost 20 years, but uh, also benefits because I knew how to integrate it really quickly into my life and, and know where I missed opportunities and identify what I can do today. And I call it the violent year, but it, it, it required me to really reprogram my subconscious with a new set of values and, and, and a system of ideas. And uh, it was really painful because some things I had to let go, uh, like, you know, core family in Israel that I had to decide to focus less on and focus on the things I want to do and re rethink about other values in my life. Uh, what I think is missing is, is a technology, I call it, of uh, Rand talks about solving the is-ought gap, which is how to derive morality, objective morality, out of facts, reality, yeah, right? Yeah. I call it's it the fact-value thing that Hume started and exactly. everybody's been dealing with, trying to deal with, but it, the way she deals with it is like unique. Very unique, and I think she solves the problem. Yes. And, uh, anyway, but there is the, what, what happens, let's say I give you the ought, and you say, okay, I know exactly how to operate, I know exactly what my virtues and values should be. How do, how do I then go about implement that in my life? The first thing is, like you said, what do I want to do? How the heck do you know what you want to do? Right. And that requires a system of introspection that nobody teaches us to do. Nobody has a course on introspection for the sake of discovering what you love about this world. And I've developed this for myself. I got some help with, from, from a lady called Jean Moroni who taught me how to write on, she called it thinking on paper. And it's basically a diary system, a logging system where you write what you love and why and what it means to you. And suddenly you see all arrows pointing in the same directions. It's all the same thing. I love being in front of people. Uh, so as a 16 or a 20 year old, you ask yourself big questions like I want to work on by myself in a cubicle or I enjoy being around people. Okay, it's being around people. What type of being around people? One-on-one, -on -one, a psychologist type, or do you want to be a speaker in front of a thousand people? Those are kind of the big questions that you, one should ask themselves in, in the process. And that is something that Ayn Rand takes for granted. It's, she gives you Howard Rourke without the process of how a child a Howard Rourke or a teenager or Howard Rourke develops into that. Because I think she's just an amazing introspector herself. She knew from the age of eight what she wanted to become. Yeah, and that's, uh, we're well, not all like that. Exactly, right? and I mean yeah. that, that, that's the problem with with the fictional hero. That's I mean, the, the, there's not many problems you can bring up with the fictional heroes of Ayn Rand. However, the one is the the absolute certainty that they all have. You know, the heroes. Well, they're and moral. Stuff. They're moral. The moral ideas, certainly, yes. and, and that they are exactly what they need to be. Exactly. But you have the question is, what do you do with them? 
Right. How do you take them and implement them in, or, in your own Exactly. Life? Well, yeah. no, see, you mentioned something that resonates with my audience, too, because when I talk about, about ways to kind of integrate your ideas, I, I talk, I, the, our themes are focus, integration, and celebration. Mm -hmm. So focus is identifying those things that you're good at, identifying the things that you want to do with your life for the right rational reasons mm -hmm. not just I want to make a lot of money to get a car right. no, I want to make a lot of money as a byproduct of my rational values right. my, okay. money is a means to an end yes exactly yeah. and it's a byproduct of your work exactly okay and then but you need to integrate those ideas to your life you can't just have the ideas and then do something else action action has to be integrated with your philosophy and then then you get to celebrate. Yes. Because that's when you reach the time in life where you can enjoy the car and the, the wine and the and yeah. the fun vacations. And it has to happen during the process. Yes. Uh, you, you know, I, I reminded my, I, I'll tell you a quick story. So we're miserable, me and my three other partners of our software company in the Silicon Valley are miserable. It's like the middle of the night in a lousy hotel where you cannot walk without socks. It's stinky. <laughs> And in, it's called the Aria Hotel. I'll give them bad publicity. Don't, don't <laughs> yeah, stay in the, the Aria that, Hotel. That, that tells a, a bad, uh, bad uh, uh, you know, trip advisor exactly, review. Right there. A one, one star <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. for Aria in, in Mountain View. But we were rejected by so many investors. And we were running out of money. And we're miserable and we're working the whole night. And we're tired and, you know, just desperate. And they go to sleep. And I sit down and I write my, in my diary. And suddenly I zoom out and I say, I'm actually living one of the best days of my life now. I will remember this slow point as an, such an insp inspiration, which is exactly what, what I th the way I think about that day. We were miserable, we were, didn't know what to do, but we came out of it and the next morning we actually got someone who invested enough money for us to go for the next round. Um, so you have to celebrate during even the tough times, but I know where I'm going, I'm on the right path. You said rational values, right? Mm -hmm. If I know I'm going the right path, even if you fail, you know, remember what happened to Howard Work. Yeah, he failed. Work, worked in the yeah, quarry. He'd never be an architect. Exactly. Uh, but, but he knew he was on the right track. So having the self-esteem, having the, the confidence that you're doing the right thing is, is the way I would celebrate it almost on a daily basis. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, I mean, that goes back to the topic we both are into is that, that, the concept of happiness and right. how to achieve it. That's part of, the, that's part of our show ethos. Uh -huh. And the way, I think the way you see this and this is the way I see it as well, happiness is just a state of consciousness. It's not like, a, it's not like something that's a goal that's outside of you. You know, it's, it's something- It's not that, a, something you achieve in me and, and then you're there, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you can be, Ha you should be happy every day as just how your general sense of being if your values are aligned with your actions yeah. and if you are doing the thing that you want to do and the thing that you love to do and maybe you're not doing that maybe you're unhappy but you got to work toward getting it that way and I think it's a sinus it, it's not happiness is not like a steady state every day is different every year is different and I think your goals change over time yes uh, but there is a level of uh, certainty that evolves over time that I'm pursuing what, what I want to pursue and I have the confidence uh, and the self-esteem to go achieve it. Um, you know, I always ask people when I'm on stage, do I look happy? And they nod. And I'm not like a smiling, jumping right. with joy, but I, I project purposefulness, which is like, this guy knows what That's he's what doing. That's what happiness right? looks like. Exactly. Yeah. And so, I would say, so I have a four-step system. Yeah, tell me about that. I've heard about well, this. Well, first, you, you said it. What is happiness? You have to understand the goal. It's a state of consciousness that proceeds from the achievement of your own rational values. That's a very important definition. If you don't get it, you, you, don't want to, you don't know where you're going to because it's a state of consciousness that you cannot create. It needs to be created by your subconscious after you try and successfully achieve your rational values. So if you think about what she, she's saying in that definition, Ayn Rand, she says, find your values, discover them, act to gain them. What you'll get is happiness. So, so you say, okay, I get it. Now what? That's why I say, you know, uh, yeah. what is the ought is get? Yeah, exactly. you know, the opposite. <laughs> so first thing, observe. Like a good scientist, observe yourself. Look at yourself. What am I doing with my time? What do I choose to do with there are no constraints? What are my hobbies? Why are they my hobbies? What is it about the people that I like 
Why do I like them? Why am I attracted to that woman and not that woman? Why am I attracted to that environment and not that environment? Log that and try to derive from that what your subconscious is reacting to, what values. And the idea is to become a better valuer of life to develop a muscle in your subconscious or your conscious mind that says, I know what I react to. And I can tell you right now, if you give me something, if I love it or not, because I'm, I'm very good at understanding what my subconscious reacts to. Uh, you put me in a dark room, <laughs> you know, I, I won't be happy. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, so that's the first thing, log, log it and observe yourself. So I call it observe your values. Second thing is try to slowly uh, identify core themes in those values. It's like, whoa, all those things lead towards creative work, uh, less of this kind of work, more of this kind of work around people. What can I do with that, you right? And then the third step is you integrate all of that into what I call a central purpose. Well, I didn't call that, that's a, an Ayn Rand concept, yeah, but right. a central purpose in your life, think about a mission of a company. The company would be lost if it didn't have a mission statement. I claim that you will be lost if you don't have a right. central purpose. The question is how clear are you on it? And it can change over time again, but I have today a, a sentence that I write to myself that I look at and say that, that is what my life is about right now. After you do that, then the fourth step is, I call it productize or monetize yourself. Find a way for someone to pay you to do what you want to do right. and make sure that you become the best at it. And by the way, if you have a chance to get rich and successful, it's only with the things that you love doing because otherwise you won't have the motivation to, be, to invest the time in it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's ironic and, and beautiful that you're saying these things because it reminds me of this thing that I've, I've told, I told listeners about this before. I have this, um, I have this uh, thing that I wrote down uh, when I first got out of the military in like the early 90s and I wasn't sure exactly what I, where I was going to go and I wrote down a thing, this thing called the purpose of my life and everything that I put down on that list I've done in one way or another and I, I still I carry that I don't have it with me right now yeah, yeah, but, but I, it's, it's, it's handy it's on my desk <laughs> every day and That's you look great. at it and, I, and it's a sense of pride it's a sense of fuel it's a sense of motivation because the things that are there are things that really matter to me you know and I kind of stumbled on it I didn't go about it the way yeah. you know the way you've defined which is which is awesome by the yeah. way uh, but it's a, it's a kind of thing that everybody needs to do in their own kind of way mm -hmm. because you have to identify that what matters to you and you have to then go about doing it in, in the way that is going to give you that happiness. Right. It's not an easy problem, of course. You know, happiness it's one is hard. Of, happiness is a, is a very difficult really problem. You know? <laughs> it really it's ironic that it is, too. Yeah, but, and, and, and well, unfortunately, not a lot of people get to that state. You know, you look around you and uh, you don't see a lot of very happy people. Yeah, Very and I think that breeds a lot of social discontent as well. You know, it's like the people that are most unhappy are the ones that want to impose their unhappiness on the people that are happy. And usually the people that are happy and successful are the people that have to pay for it, the people that aren't happy exactly. and successful. And that leads to a lot of resentment and, and strife. Yeah, we won't go into the reason, you know, what happens in the educational system. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, you don't develop the sense of independence. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, view of yeah, life. yeah. Well, yeah, that's a whole different... That's, that's what we're trying to do. You know, when, when at ARI, we send a lot of books into high schools, like right. we spread 4.3 million books We so still far. do the essay contest? We still, yeah. it's one of the world's largest and it pay, it's the highest paying, $25,000 for first place. It's really getting, I, I think the power of fiction is the power to show you an ideal that embodies all of those values. Right. Uh, and you, you, you know, you, you meet people, it's like, oh, the fountainhead changed my life, or right. the Atlas truck changed my life. And there's a reason for that, because if you read a nonfiction essay, it does, it's, it's very clarifying, but it's, it's not life-changing right. in a way that fiction is. Yeah, fiction is, is the, is the uh, embodiment of values and characters. Right. And if you can identify with that, if you can identify with their struggle, that's why, that's why all these great myths are great Pretty myths. Nice. Right. You know, these great myth stories, that's why they resonate with people. Because, and people are discovering that again. It's, it's, it's a it movement, is. you know, and there's a lot of, there's a, a lot of kind of 
you know, public intellectuals talking about a lot of these myths and things like that. And it's actually quite quite re- refreshing because yeah. you storytelling know, it, is so it, it allows people yeah. to focus on on what what matters. Like, right. why is this myth such a resonating myth? Why is why does Howard Rourke such a uh, resonate with so many people that are independent minded? Yeah, you know, completely. I, by the way, I, I tried to do that, and, and it's a parental advice. Uh, in order, instead of lecturing to my kids about those values, I told stories. Yes. And in the end of the day, I wrote a short book. It's called It's called Sophie. It's about a heroic girl. And it's just my attempt to explain to my kids what it is about. And it was so rewarding and I think very beneficial to them and for me to do this. So, um, telling yeah, stories. That's, telling that's, stories, that's, exactly. That's, uh, that's an art by itself. It, it is, it is. <laughs> now, before we wrap it up, yep. I want to uh, explore just a couple more in areas <laughs> of expertise that, that we share. Yeah. So, you, you grew up in Israel. Correct. Yep. In and a kibbutz, you know. In a, a kibbutz, kibbutz, of course. Yeah, yeah. it's that's the uh, that's the uh, communist, um, communist ideal. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, and another attempt to make it work. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. How many more attempts do we need? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> so, but when you were so, but in as you were growing up, you like all Israeli Israeli uh, citizens, you had to go into the military. Yeah, I was in the Air Force. So, yeah. and then you were where you were a helicopter pilot yeah, as well. Yeah, I was, right? but I didn't I, d- I didn't sign up for the five or seven years uh, <laughs> to fly it professionally. So yeah. I actually uh, I, I finished it after like two years. Did another year in uh, in intelligence and operations, and then quit. And did, and I'm happy I did. Right. Yeah. So, but but you did. So you have you have a lot of diverse interests. And it's something that resonates with me. Yeah. You're you're in the military. Yeah. You're a musician. I am. You know, a we're both musicians. Drummers. You're yeah. a jazz yeah. drummer. Yeah. I could never get the hang of drums, but <laughs> I got the hang of guitar and vocals and piano and stuff. Yeah. So we got to jam sometime. Yeah, let's do that. So, uh, and then you're also into cars. You've you've, oh, you've kind of had sports car racing in your blood. I'm still I'm racing here. Miatas. Yes. Yes. Spec Miatas. Yes. Spec uh, Miatas. I love NASA, that. right? The I, NASA. Uh, I love. I love it. I love it. It's I know great. it's fun. Whenever yeah. I, have, I have the time, a spare weekend, and uh, I, you know, I, there's just this company. I give them the money. I show up in the racetrack, <laughs> and it's it's, a, it's an amazing. Yeah. There's nothing that compares as far as, as the rush and adrenaline. Exactly that hitting that. that apex and oh, getting that good exit off. Yeah, yeah. and being consistent with it. Exactly. That's, that's yeah, being able to hit every apex consistently, even when your tires are getting yeah. down on it. Yeah. That's the funnest part. And yeah. you know, part, going back just to close the circle on on. Uh, discovering your values. Mm-hmm. I realized with a lot of introspection that I love the qualifying more than the race. Yes. And you know why? Because I realized that I love, I love the process of self-improvement, to get better, me getting better over time. And uh, me beating the clock every time and doing it a little better was so rewarding to me. I don't know why, you know, it's some, something very hard to explain what in your subconscious is so is connecting with that. Right. But it's just a fact that me, as me, uh, that's what I love doing. And it's an achievement for me to realize right. that. Because the next time I'm going to play tennis or do something a little different, I know what I love about this. I know what aspects of it to look for. Um, so. Yeah, I, I'm the same way. I mean, the, the, the every, every activity that I do or every that, a lot of people that, that kind of share our mentality, yeah. it's not about doing the activity. It's about getting better at the activity. And when you get better at the activity, that's a reward in itself. Reward. Even if you're never going to be the greatest race car driver in the world, you're going to be better than you were the next time out. Yeah, but I do enjoy coming first as well. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> and on that yeah. note, thank you for being on thank the show. Thank you so All much. Right. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I know.